in their right mind could possibly deny the 20th century was entirely mine. Catapult the propaganda. The truth is out there. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. The military industrial complex. Funded yet unofficial government agency. Take the red pill. If this were a dictatorship, it'd be a heck of a lot easier. From a craftsman style bunker somewhere on the 39th parallel, it's PID Radio. Welcome. I'm Derek Gilbert. <laughs> I'm Sharon Gilbert. Welcome, everybody. Uh, for those of you who listened to last week's show and you're concerned that we don't know where we are <laughs> because we said that we really don't know, it was a joke. Yeah. We do know exactly where we are. We don't own a GPS device, but we do know exactly where we are. Yeah, well, Google Earth is wonderful for tools like that. I know. It's I a beautiful it. day here in central Indiana, and so uh, it, it's Talking kind of Talking about dark things is kind of odd. On a day, day to talk things. about dark things, but uh, these are things that we need to examine, especially as Christians in this world. We can't close our eyes and turn a blind eye to them, and that's why we do what we do peeringintodarkness.com and PID Radio. And our That's guest right. is one who has certainly looked right into the heart of darkness. And, uh, in fact, a guy who first came to our attention through the radio broadcast of the late Michael Corbin, and we'll be talking about that. He's the author of Lucifer's Lodge, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Catholic Church, and Satanic Crime, A Threat in the New Millennium. He's also got an audio book out there called The Da Vinci Code Cabal. It's uh, William H. Kennedy. William, welcome back to PID Radio. Thank you for having me back, uh, Derek and Sharon. It's very nice to be here. Michael Corbin, let's let's jump jump right in there um, because he's a guy whose work was far more important than the acclaim he received from the world at large. How did you first come to know Michael Corbin? Michael Corbin. Initially, I came in contact with Michael Corbin in 1989. He had, uh, back then, before there was anything called the Internet, there was uh, a thing called the Information Superhighway, which was the predecessor to the Internet. And Michael had one of the very first news services on paranormal themes like UFOs and Satanism called the Paranet. And um, I actually, very early on, around 1991, I was doing my master's degree at San Francisco State University in philosophy, and I emailed Michael Corbin in very early email. This is, this is a long time ago. And um, he emailed me back. Now, uh, what Michael did beyond that, he was also a pioneer in Internet broadcasting. He had a program called the Paranet Continuum, which was a web broadcasting radio show that he started around about 1994. And I used to listen to that when he, uh, what later became known as the Internet came out. And back then, the Internet had a lot of trouble, like a uh, rail player used to crash. And if people remember, the Internet for broadcasting wasn't too good in the mid-'90s. A little bit later on, it got better. But I used to uh, listen to Michael quite a bit, and he had a lot of programs on uh, guests, I should say, like uh, Malachi Martin and uh, Graham Hancock, and really fascinating writers in the paranormal realm and I used to uh, listen to that program quite a bit now to fast forward ahead uh, I was friends with father Malachi Martin who um, Michael Corbin used to have on the show and it's quite interesting because Art Bell came along with his program Coast to Coast. Art Bell at the time was a political commentator uh, in Nevada and what happened was he more or less ripped off Michael Corbin's Paranet Continuum radio show and formed Coast to Coast AM. And when you listen to both programs, even the bumper music on Coast to Coast AM to this day sounds virtually identical to the original Paranet Continuum broadcast in 1994. Basically, what, uh, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Basically, what Art Bell did is he stole 
Michael Corbin show and his guest list informed Coast to Coast AM. You were saying earlier that he never got the um, due credit for uh, the different things he did, Michael Corbin. Now, uh, to fast forward again, in 2002, uh, Michael started another program called A Closer Look. And what happened there, I had listened to an earlier program he did on the Paranet after Malachi Martin had died. And there were some rumors about Father Martin's death that were totally false that were expressed on uh, Michael's show. So I sent Michael an email, and he said, well, I'll have you on my new show. This was in 2003 on A Closer Look. Now, I went on A Closer Look. I was a regular guest on A Closer Look for five years. I was on O four or five times a year for five years, and that's where, you know, you, uh, you two heard me, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, on PID Radio. And from Michael's show, I became kind of an international figure in paranormal studies. I became uh, famous as a direct result of Michael Corbin's uh, radio program, A Closer Look, for which I am grateful for. Now, uh, tragically, Michael passed away uh, not too long ago, just you know, a, a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. even. And uh, there's a lot of rumors about his death on the internet. And I just want to make it clear: I believe Michael Corbin did die of natural causes. He died of a massive stroke. And uh, tragically, Michael didn't take as good physical care of himself as he should have. He was overweight, and he was a heavy cigarette smoker which, uh, you know, we can all learn a lesson from Michael Corbin's death. You know, if you're listening and you're a smoker, quit. If you're, an over, if you're overweight, start exercising and eating right. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a great lesson we can learn from him. And I'd like to thank, uh, you know, you two, Derek and Sharon, and Sharon especially, for putting up that wonderful tribute page to Michael Corbin, which I'm sure he would have greatly appreciated. You know, I was on Michael's show one week before he died. It's the last program I did in a five-year run, and I said two times on that last show I did with him that it was my favorite radio show, and it really was and is and always will be and the best work i've done is really behind me now that a closer look is uh over i consider my radio work uh on a closer closer look to be far superior to any of my writings or anything else i've, I've done so i'm eternally grateful to michael corbin and he, i hope he ultimately gets the due credit he deserves for being such an internet pioneer well, if we have anything to, to do about that, you know, hopefully we can help push that along a little bit. But sadly, uh, Bill, uh, as our friend Visigoth has wisely pointed out, no one ever got rich or famous by telling the truth. And uh, that is the difference between Michael's show and other shows like his that, has, that seek to achieve ratings and advertising success as opposed to just telling the truth. Amen. You can tell the difference between those shows and his by how successful those other programs are. And it's not just Coast to Coast AM. There are others, and we'll refrain from naming names, but there are others out right, there right. building on Michael's work and, uh, and uh, claiming it as their own. Uh, they know who they are. We know who they are, and we'll just leave it at that. But, uh, you know, Bill, uh, as a professional radio broadcaster with 15 years' experience on, under my belt, uh, I am not stretching the truth to say that I consider Michael Corbin to be the best uh, – radio talk show host that i have heard bar none um and, oh definitely so i mean in any he, in any genre in any genre in he, any genre he was so informed he knew something about everything he was an amazingly intelligent man he had a beautiful and i considered the best speaking voice in radio mm -hmm. you know his speaking voice was wonderful and he really understood the power of the internet and technology even his bumper music and such was very very you know high production very well done and as you say you know he wasn't just burned by coast to coast but it, as again i don't i don't want to throw stones at anyone but there's a lot of people in patriot radio there's a lot of you know people who are now making a lot of money 
of conspiracy-related things that really draw on Michael's work. And Michael was nationally syndicated at one juncture when I was on his show, but he saw how miserable and horrible even the alternative Patriot Networks had become, and he, of his own volition, withdrew from national syndication as to avoid getting caught up in the, um, you know, the whole advertising and fundraising matrix, which, to be honest with you, it's becoming just as bad as the mainstream media is as far like there's one fellow out there now who's who's running a big money fundraiser and um it it when it becomes more about money than the truth just a lot is lost it's it's hard amen. to put my finger on you amen. know but a lot is lost no, you know amen. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, and uh, it was to his credit that Michael followed the uh, evidence wherever it led, regardless of how it affected his ratings mm-hmm. or his uh, uh, financial standing. Oh, he walked away from money. He deliberately walked away from money, as not to have his ideas and uh, uh, warped or to promote products and systems which he believed were kind of a ripoff. Mm-hmm. You know, he he was very particular about what was advertised, you know, and a lot of these things, I don't want to name names again, but there's water filtration companies and, um, you know, food packaging companies and different things that support Patriot Radio, which when you look at the hard facts, if there's a natural disaster of any kind, you know, it doesn't matter how much gold you have stored in your cellar. It doesn't matter how much, you know, water filters you have. It doesn't matter how much packed up food you have because uh, the government can ultimately, in a time of crisis under the law, seize all those things anyway. Amen. So it's- so to advertise them aggressively as if you can – it's like when uh, people, when they were selling duct tape and plastic, worrying about a, uh, a chemical. Att- you know, duct tape, plastic, and a, and a water filter are not going to save you if someone decides to set off a smart bomb. Right. You know? In fact, those products are made out of oil, which that money just went straight to the oil companies. And Michael and I had a lot of conversations about this because I do my own little show called Sphinx Radio, which is more geared towards paranormal and occult history themes. It's not exactly a patriot type show, but I got all kinds of offers from all kinds of networks to go nationally syndicated. And when Michael pointed out this to these things to me, I just, you know, I, I saw what he was saying and I withdrew from it. There's a lot of ridiculousness, yeah. even in the alternative media. You know, there, you got you, you to sort the wheat from the chaff wherever you are. Absolutely. We're, Sharon and I are convinced that the medium of exchange after the bomb drops is going to be toilet paper, not gold. <laughs> so uh, moving on to the things that you're working on now, Bill, uh, you, you've got uh, a couple of uh, books that should be part of anyone's research or reference library, Satanic Crime, A Threat in the New Millennium, and Lucifer's Lodge, a very dark look at the uh, abuse that took place um, with the protection and knowledge of many within the power hierarchy of the Catholic Church. But you've also got some things that you're doing, very interesting things you're doing at your website, WilliamHKennedy.com. Tell us about that. Well, what I've done is, it's really my goal, um, Derek and Sharon, or or not to be sexist, I should say Sharon and Derek, (laughs) uh, um, is is I want to educate the general public in occult history. That's really my background. I mentioned earlier I had a master's degree in philosophy, and I studied very closely with people like Jacob Needleman and Houston Smith and people along those those sorts of uh, occult esoteric realms. I'm not an occultist myself, but I think it's essential for everyone to understand occult history. And what I've done on my webpage with the rise of YouTube and Google Video and uh, Gooba TV and all these different um, 
broadcasting type things on the internet, I formed a series of occult multimedia pages. And what I've done is I've gone on to the internet and I've gotten the very best documentaries on occult history that are out there. My occult history multimedia page, which I dedicated to Michael Corbin, by the way, has all the best documentary films on subjects like Kabbalah and alchemy and the Da Vinci Code and Freemasonry, the office theosophy, Rosicrucianism, things of that nature. And I think it's imperative that people understand these esoteric subjects because they so control and shape our culture in a way that people don't realize. A lot of people say, well, why bother studying the Kabbalah? which is a Jewish school of mysticism, which is kind of like a Western yoga. Well, when you consider that people like Madonna and Britney Spears are practitioners of Kabbalah, look how much they shape our culture. They're on television and radio every day. So the ideas, beliefs, and symbols that they promote and believe are saturated into our culture, just those two names right there. And a big part of my web pages is also to warn warn people against the dangers of these sorts of things. For example, if you remember Britney Spears, not long ago, she was a uh, very together teenage singer who was preserving her virginity until she got married. Uh, then she got involved with Madonna and the Kabbalah. Now she's a bisexual raving maniac who's shaving her head mm -hmm. in and out of mental institutions. So I see a direct link between these occult connections and uh, things like mental health, you know? And um, we're all different. We can all handle things differently. And uh, we all have ways of preserving our public image. But uh, over the years, I've gotten you know, thousands of emails from people who got involved with like transcendental meditation or silver mind control ESP training who wound up going absolutely bananas. So a big part of my webpage is to warn people against these things. Now, most things come very candy coated and most things come very attractive in this world, you know, but you got to look for the hook and the bait. And if you watch these series of films, they're set up historically in chronological order at WilliamHKennedy.com on the occult multimedia page. You will see two things. Number one, as I said earlier, how pervasive these things are in contemporary culture. And number two, how psychologically damaging they can be to individuals. Now, my webpage isn't all grim. I have a lot of really fun stuff on the occult multimedia page. I have a lot of like Penn and Teller clips and John Stossel, who's on 2020, who exposes a lot of this stuff, a lot of skeptical stuff where it's appropriate. And I also have, uh, you know, a Christian perspective. I have a lot of Tex Mars, if you're familiar. I'm yeah. sure you're familiar oh, with yeah. him. Oh, yeah. He's a very interesting person who looks at these things. So it's not all doom and gloom. Some of it is uh, quite entertaining, and it's very informative as well. And um, as I said, I got there's so much stuff out there as far as documentaries and articles and sound clip goes. What I did is I went through as many of them as I could, and I picked out the very, very best documentaries and the very, very best sound clips. And, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh, film there, and it's organized very neat, WilliamHKennedy.com, I'll say it again, it's free to listen to, it's free to use, and I have products there for sale as well, you can get my books and some other things I sell, but you know, it's no obligation, you don't have to register, or you know, I won't even know who you are, people are welcome to come to WilliamHKennedy.com, and they can um, check out these multimedia pages. Now, just for this show, I'm going to do something very special. I'm going to, for free, I'm going to put up uh, e-books of Lucifer's Lodge and Satanic Crime for one week 
from the air date of this broadcast. So people can even take a look at my uh, two ebooks for free. And I'll also put up a couple of my, uh, I wear different hats in life. I'm also a um, personal development uh, coach, kind of, and I have a memory improvement course and a stress reduction course, both of which people can try for free this week. And I should point out that a lot of people will wonder this. My stress reduction course is non-mystical, non-spiritual, and non-religious, and what it's based on is uh, what they call progressive relaxation. And when I tell you just briefly what it is, you'll know it's safe. It's, you, you just sit down quietly and you say, relax your feet, relax your calves, relax mm -hmm. your knees. So there's nothing mystical or spooky. It's actually developed uh, by physical therapists. That's how I fall asleep on nights when I'm having oh, yeah, trouble I, fall asleep. <laughs> well, actually, I'm really familiar with that technique, and it works. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it works, and uh, it's perfectly safe. Now, mm -hmm. the problem with other techniques, and I've tried a lot of these other things, like TM or silver mind control mm -hmm. or different forms of Eastern or yoga meditation. Now, I'll give you a mouthful. I'll give you a technical term. There's a transcendental referent into them, and basically what that means is that there's something spiritual for, like, in the TM movement, they, the mantra they give you is actually the the name of a Hindu god mm -hmm. and uh, silver mind control you use a visualization where you pick a figure in your mind who starts telling you how to lead your life you know a spiritual mm -hmm. figure so that stuff as far as I'm concerned is a slippery slope into possible demonic possession not necessarily you're demonic opening possession. you're opening a doorway though and inviting something to come through and, uh, and right and, and there again it depends on your psychological makeup how it will affect you like someone like Britney Spears you can connect her mental collapse directly when she started to do Kabbalah meditation which is actually similar to transcendental meditation so everyone's a little bit different but I will tell you this as well I haven't met anyone who there hasn't been a negative rebound on some level using these uh, esoteric or occult techniques mind techniques but um as I say, my stuff, memory improvement, and uh, my stress away technique, they're purely secular and purely, you use your body, yeah, I'm sorry, you use your mind to tell your body to relax, mm -hmm. and you use mental images to store information rather than audio in your mind to store information. So those things are perfectly safe. And as I say, people can try them for free. This is at WilliamHKennedy.com. I also have a speed reading course up there. I can't give it away for free because it's not mine. Uh, it was developed by a woman named uh, Karen Stark. But for people who are interested in expanding their minds and expanding their consciousness, there are certainly safe and effective and highly useful ways to do so like speed reading and memory improvement without any of this mystical mumbo jumbo which has you know landed a lot of people in uh psychological peril and even spiritual peril in certain cases sure so oh, i just want to just to make it clear today is june 1st and right. this, this interview will go up tonight so right so the, the june 7th so june 7th i'll take it off the 8th okay June 8th. Uh, so we're being clear. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, the offer would run between June the 1st and June the 7th of 2008. Of 2008. Just in case yeah. you're listening 2008, to this. 2008, right, yeah, just to make it clear. Now, my materials are always free if people email me for U.S. military and their families. So if, if anyone in the U.S. military and their families wants to try my stress technique, have them email me at any time, and it's always free for them. And we'll put the links to uh, Bill's website and the links to the various pages that we're discussing today and his email address, if that's all right with you, Bill, uh, at the, Fine, uh, sure. in the show notes at PIDradio.com. Now, Bill, in all the research that you've done in pulling together these hundreds of hours of videos, what's the overall sense you get of the, uh, say, the spiritual threat level? to uh, the world oh that's a good question yeah you, well, you know, instead be... of the homeland security threat level <laughs> what's the spiritual threat level from these uh, occult practices that are out there 
Well, to be honest, uh, Derek and Sharon, all you have to do is uh, turn on CNN and look at the way human beings treat each other. And when you see the horrible way they treat each other, when you look at the forces and people that are behind this, you will see that um, our politicians, many of them, are involved with occult and esoteric practices themselves. And all the horror you see in the world is a side effect, I believe. You know, there'll be people who debate me. I believe it's a side effect of this uh, nefarious spiritual uh, milieu that permeates um, our higher political offices. For example, a lot of people are familiar with the fact that President Bush and John Kerry are both members of the Skull and Bones Society, which is a fraternity at Yale, mm -hmm. which they pick 15 of the top students uh, at Yale every year and have them uh, join this fraternity wherein they actually worship Lucifer as part and parcel of their initiation ceremony. So when you really look at, you know, to, to look at your question again, what are the spiritual ramifications or the overview, you don't have to look far beyond these secret societies which ultimately worship Lucifer. You know, if you want to understand why George Bush didn't respond well to Katrina, you just have to look at the fact that he's in league with the devil. Uh, and then you'll, you know, things start to fall into place. Why did he start an unnecessary war getting our young people killed over the other side of the world over oil? And we're also paying, you know, four or five dollars a gallon for oil. Well, you don't have to look too far. The, the fact of the matter is our world leaders are involved with satanic secret societies. And that's the, the, the big ramification. And when you even look at other groups like the um, Bohemian Grove out in California, which was founded in 1872, uh, what they do is they have a mock human sacrifice before an owl god, and they dress up in Ku Klux Klan type robes and regalia and the membership of that some of it intersects with the skull and bones like George Bush is a member Henry Kissinger is a member Jimmy Carter is a member Arnold Schwarzenegger is a member Herbert Hoover was a member uh, uh, you know, right down the line, uh, Ronald Reagan was a member, Nixon. And people say, well, you know, maybe this is just a fun men's club. But then when you look even a little more closely, for example, um, Richard Nixon, not only was he an occultist at the Bohemian Grove, but he also took the advice of Gene Dixon, who was a psychic concerning American foreign policy. And if you go to my Satanic Crime multimedia page, which is at williamhkennedy.com, I even have the sound clip of Richard Nixon discussing Gene Dixon's advice concerning Middle East policy in 1972. He used, you know, he used a psychic to determine our foreign policy. So there again, he's tied right into the occult. Well, Reagan did that too. Yeah, Ronald Reagan. Reagan. Now, Reagan is even more bizarre. Reagan was a member of the Bohemian Grove and worshipped this owl, and he used a an astrologer named Joan Quigley. Uh, Nancy Reagan used to contact her on a daily basis about how Reagan, you know, when he should travel and what decisions he could make. Now, here is a big punchline for you that few people know. How the Reagans were introduced to Joan Quigley was through another Bohemian Grove member named Merv Griffin, a former oh talk show host. Oh, my gosh. Okay. And Joan Quigley's grandfather was also a member of the Bohemian Grove. So for people who say, oh, this is just a fun men's club, that's a lot of nonsense. These people take these occult and esoteric ideas deeply into their policies to the point where the Reagans asked a fellow Bohemian Grove member, Merv Griffin, 
about who they should get as a psychic advisor. Now, Merv Griffin, who we know for shows like Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune and his talk show, he was also instrumental in promoting the career of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, That's true. the founder of Transcendental Meditation. Now, most people remember the Maharishi who died recently as being tied in with the Beatles, but the Beatles weren't with the Maharishi for very long. It was, you know, about four months was their time with him, and they kind of broke off from him pretty quickly. Now, it's in the early 1970s when Merv Griffin started to have the Maharishi on his talk show that the Maharishi became very, very rich you know, and wound up being worth billions of dollars. There again, as a direct result of the Bohemian Grove. So the counter arguments I get about, you know, this is just, you know, the, the skull and bones is just a fun, you know, fraternity kids fooling around. And the Bohemian Grove is just a lot of theatrical nonsense by a lot of rich people. Well, not really, not when you put it under the microscope and examine the people and policies and the things that spin out of it, it becomes quite frightening. And, uh, there's also a pretty much confirmed homosexual activity at the Bohemian Grove. It came out a couple years ago that a porn star named Chad Savage, who gets about forty or fifty thousand dollars per gay film, was hired as a butler at the Bohemian Grove, and he works there just about every year. Hmm. Well, what's a man who makes forty or $50,000 a year as a gay porn star, how much is he getting working at the Bohemian Grove for two weeks, and what exactly is he doing there? Is he mixing martinis, or is he doing uh, much more things than that? And just to give you an example, I hate to be risque, I know this is a Christian show, but Chad Savage did a film called How the West Was Hung. That's the kind of triple X gay hardcore porn. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say it on your show, but it's the only real way I can emphasize the point that uh, these people are, are also involved in occult homosexuality. Well, you know, For, not to interrupt, but uh, even Richard Nixon, ironically, and I'm not going to quote him directly because Nixon used pretty salty language, but he commented to someone else after going to Bohemian Grove that it was one of the most... Uh, uh, homosexually oriented events he'd ever attended. And, and again, he used oh, yeah. I mean, one, he, he, so he was there, but yeah, even Nixon said, you know, this was, you know, something that he didn't find very appealing. It was, a, he, he, I have that clip on, on the satanic crime multimedia page as well. Nixon said it was a homosexual organization. He confirmed that right. himself. Right. So, you know, in Merv Griffin, he was also, you know, he had a lot of uh, law cases against him. Uh, he would so homosexually accost people who worked for him, including uh, there was a program he had in the 70s called Dance Fever, hosted by a guy named Danny Terrio, right. who was the choreographer for Saturday Night Fever. Danny Terrio sued Merv Griffin for um, homosexual assault. So... Um, these people, as I say, that this is uh, not only do they shape our culture, they do whatever they you know please with whomever they want, whenever they want. And it's very sick and disgusting. So the spiritual ramifications of occult history are huge, and they permeate our you know our entire society. Well, in Bohemian Grove, they worship you. You've been saying it over and over again. An owl. Am I right in saying that represents Moloch? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, Alex Jones took a film of their, uh, actual ritual, which is a mock human sacrifice. And whether they see it as Moloch or not, is, they probably do, but it's really secondary. It's the fact that, you know, the voice of Lucifer is actually part of the ritual as well. Um, Walter Cronkite does the voice of, of Lucifer in a recording for this bizarre ritual. So, you know, even from this film, whatever the details are, are secondary. This film in and of itself is an, uh, an occult indictment against these uh, leaders who run our society. It's, it's quite sick.
What's their ultimate goal? What is the threat from this influence that they hold over our culture and our society? Well, quite frankly, it's not money because they have all the money they need at this juncture. They're not out for more money, but they're not satisfied with just the money. They want to, number one, control and oppress the rest of us. And uh, number two, they want to radically cut down the population of the world. I've heard different figures everywhere from 500 million to a billion people. They don't like the six billion people on this planet. And they want to cut that way, way down and basically have a sort of occult capitalist feudalism where this small handful of elitists control the world and the rest of us are more or less serfs in a medieval sense who are completely under their control. You know, a big part of medieval serfdom is that you could not leave the area from which you were born, you were bound to your lord and bound to your particular area. And look at how they're restricting travel now. They're even starting it on that level, you know. Hmm. And um, if, if for people who don't believe me, certainly ask some uh, Katrina survivors how they feel about being herded in to these, uh, you know, trailers without any uh, particular... Uh, police presence and, and people are turning on each other and, you know, assaulting old people. And uh, it's just terrible. Uh, what they're doing is just brutal. And they're going to keep moving on until they get more and more power over our daily lives. And what's frightening now, unlike any other time in history, they have the technology to do it. Your, your first book, Lucifer's Lodge, dealt with satanic ritual abuse. And uh, we talked about Bohemian Grove and some of the, uh, the sexual overtones connected to that. What is the fascination with sex in the world of the occult? What's the significance? Especially, well, especially rem- sex outside the bound of a one-man, one-woman marital relationship. Well, number one, uh, Sigmund Freud was correct in the sense that sexuality is a great and powerful human motivator, and it is a great and powerful and even embarrassing force for people. On that level, Freud was absolutely correct. It's a very obvious thing. So mixing this in with occultism, uh, there again, ultimately, it's a power kind of thing. It's having power over other people. And if I've talked to a lot of survivors of rape on different uh, levels, you know, people who were survivors of priest molestation and adult people who were raped by other adults, and they'll all tell you the biggest thing they feel and what's frightening is the powerlessness of being the victim of rape. You know, not only do they strip people of their dignity, but they strip people of, uh, you know, the, any power they have to control even their own physical actions. So as far as that goes, rape is probably the most horrible thing one human being can do to another human being. In many ways, it's worse than murder, because if you murder someone, their suffering is over, and you have to live with what you've done. If you rape someone, their suffering has just begun. Now, in the introduction of uh, Lucifer's Lodge, there was an introduction written for the book which describes some of the spiritual aspects of breaking these sexual taboos, especially with children. Uh, the, uh, what, what sort of spiritual impact uh, do, do these taboos, breaking these taboos have? Uh, why did people like Aleister Crowley, for example, uh, push the bounds of um, sexuality I mean, was it just a physical, psychological means of control, or were they looking for some spiritual power that uh, was achieved through uh, this sort of activity? Well, how I'd respond to that question, Derek, is I can tell you that in 2003, I went to the protests outside the cathedral in Boston. These were survivors of priest rape and ritual abuse. And two or three of them told me confidentially that they felt that they were being pestered by spiritual entities. So I also suspect in the trauma 
of all of this, it makes people susceptible to uh, demonic infestation and possession. I think that's a big part of it because out of the frustration and psychological demeaning of being raped or molested as a child, the human mind by nature will reach out and fantasize about destroying their abuser and they will call on God, the devil, heaven and hell to wreak revenge upon these people who have abused them and sometimes, not all the times now, but sometimes within that psychological dynamic of revenge, demonic infestation can occur. So there's definitely a spiritual component to uh, rape and things like ritual abuse, which do involve uh, the satanic realm. And I say that purely now. This isn't theoretical. This is what survivors of clerical ritual abuse have told me. You know, they've said this to me, and I've heard it over and over again. So there is that element there to it. And, and uh, as far as the abuser goes, they just assume that the person they're abusing becomes possessed. They, they really, you know, they don't care or they may want that to happen. So there's that element as well. And I say that purely reporting as a journalist, not as a as someone with a theological background, I'm merely reporting what has been reported to me. Bill, I haven't had a chance to read Satanic Crime yet, and we've talked about Satanic uh, sexual um, abuse within the church and within the political realm. How does Satanic Crime, uh, you've got it as the threat to the new millennium. Could you explain that to me? Well, sure. Satanic Crime is my sequel to Lucifer's Lodge. And what I did in Satanic Crime, the first chapter is called A Brief History of Modern Satanism. And what I do in that chapter is I give a history of the devil-worshipping movement from Aleister Crowley's birth in 1870 five up till you know contemporary times and i uh, cover people like um crowley anton lavey uh kenneth anger michael aquino boyd rice shane bugby all of the major figures in the contemporary satanism movement now what the following chapters of the book consist of are case studies of serial killers who were also Satanists. These are people who got involved with Satanic ideas, primarily through Crowley and Anton LaVey, who took it to extremes and murdered people. And the, the case studies I cover are people like um, Charles Manson and um, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, uh, Berkowitz, the son of Sam Killer. I cover the uh, Columbine case. Ricky Casso, who was the uh, boy who uh, murdered his best friend in the mid 80s and made the, the other kid um, say, Say you love Satan before he killed him. I have the um, Red Lake Indian murder, Jeff Weiss, who. Uh, gunned down his grandfather and shot up his school. Uh, he used to um, sculpt his hair into devil's horns. That's why he was expelled from his high school. He was, you know, he got involved with Satanism. So the primary case studies are people who are serial killers who are also Satanists. And in the final chapter, I covered the things we talked about earlier, like the Bohemian Grove and the Skull and Bones and the Bilderberg Group, which is the European component of this satanic cabal, which is quite frightening. So as I say, people can read 
the, the entire book, Satanic Crime, and I do this in memory of Michael Corbin for this week. They can read both books, Lucifer's Lodge and Satanic Crime, in ebook form. And I can say with confidence, uh, both books together are the best overview of Satanism and devil worship you're going to get out there. I made it very concise and clear. They're not super long. Well, they're full-length books, but they're not, you know, 700-page books. You know, they're... they're um, under 200 pages each, and I've consolidated um, a lot of the material. Now, um, Satanic Crime has gotten a lot of great critical review. Brad Steiger, the uh, famous paranormal writer, wrote the back cover blurb for it. So I've gotten a lot of um, a lot of great critical acclaim for it. Danny Schechter really loved the book. He is a uh, two-time Emmy winner. Uh, Mike Sala, who won the Pulitzer Prize a couple years ago, really likes the book. So this is the best nonfiction kind of work you will see concerning Satanism that's out there. Now, if you combine that with my Satanic Crime multimedia page and occult media page, I can say safely that WilliamHKennedy.com is the very best web page on occult history that's on the internet at this time and I challenge anybody to show me a better one and I'm even willing to put up my material for free you know even the stuff I normally sell to bring that point home there's no better place for an education in occult history than WilliamHKennedy.com Well and again we'll put links to those in the show notes at PIDradio.com I had the opportunity to interview Danny Schechter when I was uh, hosting the radio show out in Missouri he's the director and producer oh, very of good. Film, yeah. uh, in debt we trust mm-hmm. and, right uh, yeah very interesting very intelligent guy so that's uh, you know I've, I've, I've known him since i was seven years old he used to date my oldest sister <laughs> in the early 1970s my oldest sister's 15 years older than i am i've known danny a long time and danny in those days was actually the uh rock journalist at WBCN in Boston, so I got to meet people like uh, Bob Marley and uh, all sorts of famous, you know, Peter Tosh I met through Danny. I met um, uh, the Taylor, the singer, Mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of rock and roll. Aerosmith I met, so Danny's an old friend, and uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful filmmaker now. Yeah, and back then, uh, back then he was more a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> well, he gets it because uh, his his film *In Debt We Trust* is a uh, scathing indictment of the banking industry and in the way I, the I did people... see it. It was a very good, very very good book. Yeah, uh, very good documentary. I mean, I'm sorry, and uh, I mean even the debt crisis now, the whole home mortgage. This is all tied into the same people. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure, sure. As you know, it's all it's, as, it's all as, the as same the people on the well. top. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And it's, it's very all... quickly getting rid of the middle class, which is going to turn us into a world of serfs. Well, that's the thing. It will be corporate feudalism and will be serfs. And they'll have some kind of small middle class, like accountants and lawyers, that serve these rich people's needs. But the rest of us will be, well, we are being catapulted into abject poverty. I just saw a, a 60 Minutes report last week on the, the, uh, the home crisis, and it's unbelievable. In California now, it's buy one house, get one free. It's unbelievable. It's collapsed. It's like tomatoes at the supermarket. You know, buy one, get one free. This is houses. And it, there again, it's just a lot of greedy people at the top of the economic pyramid, most of whom are involved with Satanism, who are involved with luciferian secret societies and this is all just part of their uh, greater plan uh now just very quickly uh and you sort of addressed this earlier on in discussing bohemian grove and the common objection that people will raise oh these are just a bunch of guys getting together for fun the uh, satanists that you write about in satanic crime a threat in the new millennium guys like ramirez and um berkowitz, uh, berkowitz and so forth uh, to, how would you respond to people who say, well, these guys are just play acting. They were going to be evil no matter what. And uh, this idea of Satan gave them a, uh, an external image with which to identify 
Uh, to what extent are these guys really in league with a literal intelligent evil that we identify as Satan? Well, I, from their own testimonies, right, that's not what they're saying. They're, they're actually like Ricky Tasso. The boy, he claimed to have visions of Lucifer in the forest, and Lucifer used to tell him to murder people, and uh, Lucifer told him that no matter what, he would protect him. Now, what happened to Ricky Casso is once he was arrested for the murder of his friend, and they threw him in a regular prison, he was like, I think 16 or 17, he sobered up from all the drugs he was on. And, you know, he was always the toughest kid in the neighborhood. But when he found himself in a real prison around real adult criminals who weren't going to take any baloney from a 16-year-old kid, Lucifer wasn't there for, to protect him. And Ricky Casso wound up hanging himself in prison. He killed himself, you know, not long after he was arrested. So... When you look at the actual testimonies of these people, Richard Ramirez, the same thing. He sincerely believed that Lucifer would protect him no matter what. And in the case of Ramirez, he was pulled over by a cop once, and um, he, the cop had him stand outside his car while he checked a license plate. It was a stolen car. What Ramirez did is he drew a pentagram in the dust on the hood of the car, and prayed to Lucifer and ran away. Now, according to the cop who chased him, Ramirez had kind of some superhuman running strength and was able to hop over a fence that this cop was unable to get over, like he hopped over it like a rabbit. So, and that, that was in Philip Carlo's book on Richard Ramirez, too. It's not just me saying it. So, you know, not only do these people pledge their allegiance to Lucifer, sometimes they exhibit extraordinary strength, which makes it seem as if Lucifer is, in certain circumstances, protecting them, as, a, as in that case with Ramirez. You know, it's unbelievable. So as far as people who say, oh, it's just a metaphor they used or they would have done it anyway, well, not according to the killers themselves, and that's really what you got to go by, not Monday morning quarterbacks who analyze everything, and you listen to the people themselves. There are some who connect uh, uh, Charlie Manson, David Berkowitz, both to the Process Church, either tangentially or directly. Is Ramirez involved in that? Was he involved in that? Uh, he was not involved with the Process Church. What, who Richard Ramirez was involved with, and few people know this, was Anton LaVey at the Church of Satan. He went, before he went on his killing spree, he spent a week in San Francisco with Anton LaVey and performed uh, a variety of demonic rituals. And then he left and went on his murder spree. Now, when Ramirez was being tried, uh, for these murders, Anton LaVey's daughter, Zena LaVey, showed up at his trial to see what he was saying, to see if he, he was going to implicate them in any way. So Ramirez wasn't so much processed church affiliated, but he was strongly church of Satan affiliated. And I'm going to have to go back and check this because the back of my memory is tickling uh, perhaps a connection between the Church of Satan and de Grimston, who formed the Process Church as a splinter group of uh, yes, there is. Scientology. So it's sort of like the six degrees of uh, Aleister Crowley here because, of course, you can connect LeVay back through about two, three mm -hmm. links to Aleister Crowley. Oh, yeah. It's, I bring that out in, in Satanic Crime. And what's fascinating is two of Charles Manson's Followers. Now, Manson wrote an article for the Process Church magazine, and he lived right near to Grimston in San Francisco. But two of his followers, Susan Atkins and Bobby Beausoleil, were Church of Satan members before they joined the uh, Manson family. Mm. Uh, Susan Atkins was a stripper. And what she did is uh, Anton LaVey hired her to be in his topless Witches Review, which was a strip show he did in North Beach in San Francisco in the mid-60s. And um, what Susan Atkins would do is she would come out of a coffin topless, and she would play the role of a vampirist. And she had a long red fingernail, and she used to lick it and lure, you know, the, the sick 
you know, trench coat wearing men who mm -hmm. came to these things. And, uh, you know, two years later, she was licking the blood of Sharon Tate off of her fingers after she uh, murdered her. So the, the Church of Satan was kind of a um, warm up for a lot of these serial killers. Well, and that's the that's the obvious overt face of evil. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, Bill, your research has also tracked the uh, the benign smiling face of Satan through uh, your book, Lucifer's Lodge, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Catholic Church, and um, through the other research available at your website that looks at the secret society connections through the, of the rich and powerful uh, as they, uh, again, put forth a very mainstream public face uh, to, uh, to their evil. And uh, if you ask me, that's the more dangerous of the two because that's the... Uh, the the enemy that we don't know right. um you know those oh, that are right. overtly evil that are professing a belief in satan it's the wolf in sheep's clothing right those are the ones we can avoid but the wolves in sheep's clothing very right are, are the ones we need to watch out for and uh, your website williamhkennedy.com is a good resource for starting to piece together some of these uh, puzzle pieces again uh, very quickly we just have about a minute or so left bill uh, just outline again your website and what resources people can find there uh, it's WilliamHKennedy.com, WilliamHKennedy.com. My uh, two e-books will be up there for free. My uh, personal development courses will be up there for free. And my occult history multimedia pages are up there for free for uh for everyone for as long as my web page shall, shall exist. <laughs> <laughs> it's WilliamHKennedy.com. Bill, thanks for taking time out on this uh, this Sunday afternoon to join us, and we look forward to talking with you again soon. Very good. Thank you, Sharon. You're and very thank welcome, you, Bill. Derek. Hang on, and we'll talk more in a bit. And, bye bye. Uh, meanwhile, we will put all the links that we discussed in today's show to the topics that we discussed in today's show at the website, pidradio.com. And the forum is always open and available for your discussion of the show today or anything you hear on PID Radio. And you'll find the link in, in the show notes at PIDradio.com. That's right. And don't forget uh, William H. Kennedy's offer, uh, the free downloads for the next week. That's through June the 7th mm -hmm. of 2008. And, uh, boy, go to his website. All kinds of good stuff there. If you want to send us a note, you can do so at radio at peeringintodarkness.com. And until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. And living in the past God can do a new thing now In a kingdom that will last He'll make a way across your wilderness Like a river flows in the desert land There's a new day coming A new
cutting-edge news and analysis on demand. This is PID Radio.